biggest job of all is a protective tariff, thundered William Graham Sumner in a speech in 1883. This device consists in delivering every man over to be plundered by his neighbor and in teaching him to believe that it is a good thing for him and his country because he may take his turn at plundering the rest. Trade policy has roiled American politics since the founding of the nation. Throughout history, in 1828 with the Tariff of Abominations, or in the early stages of the Great Depression with the Smoot-Hawley tariffs, trade policy has proven to be an especially contentious and impactful topic. Now, tariffs have an ignominious record. They have generally imposed great economic costs. They have resulted in net losses and jobs. They have fostered all sorts of cronyism. And to put a cap on it, they have generally failed to achieve their ends. It's just about enough to drive a man to drink. Now, fortunately, today we are joined by Mary Jane Saunders, the Vice President and General Counsel at the Beer Institute. This is the first in a series of videos from the Taxpayers Protection Alliance, where I, David McGarry, a policy analyst at the Taxpayers Protection Alliance, will talk to various industry people and experts about how tariffs are affecting modern America. We, we will hit the issue from numerous different angles, and we will hopefully show how political dysfunction and the, the how the political dysfunction and economic costs that tariffs in, impose are definitely not worth the squeeze. So, Mary Jane, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, David. All right. The, my first question to you is, how are international supply lines utilized by brewers, by people in the alcohol industry? Um, so often we sort of see products on shelves, we assume that they just got there, and we don't think about where the packaging came from, where the ingredients um, of the products came from, where they were, where the various ingredients were produced, where the inputs to those ingredients were produced. It's really um, sort of an endless uh, it's an endless thread to trace back. Um, and the full picture is this incredibly complex, not even supply chain, but supply web um, that stretches all over the globe. So please tell us about that. That's a very interesting question because a lot of people assume that beer is, excuse me, an entirely local product and that you get all of your ingredients also locally. That may be true for some brewers, but for most brewers, it's an international supply chain. For example, uh, Germany is an important source of hops for many brewers. So is the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Malted barley for many foreign brewers may come from the United States. Uh, aluminum that is used for cans uh, may involve inputs from Canada, from other countries, scrap that may be produced domestically or may be imported into that is also, fascinating. Oh, please, carry on. What, one more thing to remember is that um, we have a robust market uh, for the export of domestically produced beer in the United States. So uh, if you go to Europe, you might be able to find some of those iconic U.S. brands uh, available on tap or at a bar in, um, in you, you name the European country. Conversely, we have a robust market for imported beer coming from places like the Netherlands or from Mexico. That's uh, fascinating and fantastic. I, I love the incredible collaborative nature um, of that process, which is really many, many processes. Um, it's amazing well, that people from that far around the world can come together to make and um, make available the products that people love and need. One of the things that people forget in all of this is, is actually a very practical consideration. I learned when I joined the beer industry uh, was 14 years ago that it's actually expensive to ship things over the Rocky Mountains. So that for many small brewers, it's less expensive to export their products to Europe than it is to bring them over the Rocky Mountains itself in California. And I think that's also a crucial point um, that you're getting at. A lot of times when we see trade restrictions of one kind or another, um, their their costs fall primarily on domestic companies. Um, and we uh, to, to pull out another 
Sumnerism. Um, we forget about the forgotten man. Forget about we forget about the 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 company or the person who has to bear the regulatory costs um, when government gets involved and tries to help someone. So let's move on to that. Tell me how um, metal tariffs and, and tariffs generally um, in the last few years since 2017 or 18 or so have affected the industry. Remember, is that foreign governments don't pay tariffs. Importers pay tariffs. So if you're bringing a product into the United States, you pay the tariff when it hits the U.S. market, not when you buy it in a foreign country. So the person who is paying the tariff initially is whatever company is importing that product. Then those tariffs tend to get passed on. They tend to get passed on to the next customer and the next customer and the next customer. And I, I think it's um, it's always interesting watching the the chain reactions set off by some 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 new tariff um, where you'll see the downstream manufacturers in the tariffed goods industry start pushing for tariffs for their products we had a there was a there's a somewhat high profile case as, as these things go um where um metal manufacturers were asking for tariffs because of their inputs um the, or the cost of their inputs had been raised and so you sort of get tariffs all the way down um so let me um let me let me shift towards the future um innovation is something that sort of grows and morphs um, and you never really know exactly where it's going. What are what are the sorts of innovations that we are seeing in the beer industry? Um, what What's sort of the cutting edge and how how will that innovation be affected in one way or another by trade restrictions? One of the most amazing innovations I've seen in the beer space in the last couple of years is the explosive growth in non-alcoholic beers. Instead of non-alcoholic beers in the past, these are high quality, really great taste products that have the same mother brands uh, as you would have with the alcoholic version. And we think this is a great product because it helps to uh, enhance your ability to moderate the consumption of alcohol, and um, allows you to be in an environment where other people might choose to drink alcohol and you choose not to drink alcohol, but you can still feel like you're part of the same crowd uh, by holding a, a non-alcoholic beer. Now, these products uh, are packaged the same as uh, regular alcohol beers in terms of being uh, put in aluminum cans or glass bottles. Uh, and the tariffs that apply to aluminum affect these products as well. Also, uh, we spent quite a bit of time in the last couple of years trying to avoid tariffs on beer. Uh, when the Europeans were upset about the Airbus tariffs, they were uh, proposing uh, to uh, tariff a bunch of products coming from the U.S. We were also thinking, the U.S. was also thinking about other products coming in um, Europe that it might care. And we spent a lot of time trying to avoid near being tariff and particularly not out. Interesting. Um, of course, tax avoidance is the necessary byproduct of all tax policy. So, um, uh, so let's go back to those tariffs on um, glass and, and, and on metal. Can you talk about and, and feel free to get into the feel free to get into the weeds here. This is this is one of the few places where the minutia of tariff policy is of great and extreme interest. Um, talk about exactly talk about some of the ways that those tariffs have really just mucked up the the day to day lives of your average brewer, your your average canner, or um, uh, of your average. Uh, I mean, ultimately, consumer who who might find that his favorite six pack suddenly costs more. Uh, you said tariffs on glass. I want to correct it. There are no tariffs on glass right now. We hope that there never are tariffs on glass. But in terms of aluminum, uh, what a lot of people don't realize about the tariff policy that's in place right now in the U.S. with respect to aluminum is that 
it's supposed to be a tariff on what's known as primary, which is the raw aluminum that is smelted um, and imported into the United States and then transformed into other products. Hand sheet, which is what brewers use, cans that are made from hand sheet, is made with a small amount of primary aluminum, and most of it is made from scrap and recycled aluminum. That is not subject to tariff, scrap and recycled. But what we've discovered is that 100% of what a brewer buys in terms of can sheet and cans actually has a tariff surcharge added to So you pay a tariff on 100% of what you buy, even though only a very small percentage is actually subject to tariff. And that's very disappointing because we've done some calculations and we know that the U.S. beverage industry, and this is beer and non-alcoholic beverages, have paid well over $2 billion in tariffs that have not gone to the treasury, but have gone to private sector companies. Um, and they are benefiting while everybody else is paying. I think that's a that's a crucial point. Um, the the benefits that do go to these private companies or specific favorite favorite industries are paid for specifically by by other American businesses and ultimately by consumers. It's in, in a way it's it's a sort of wealth transfer. Um, and you you'll read analyses that that estimate that however many jobs were saved in a tariff industry cost an uh, average of say 700, 800, 900, thousand dollars per jobs um and as much as i as much as i sympathize with with workers with the workers who are in those jobs and presumably want to stay in them um as a matter of public policy it's a extraordinarily high cost um i don't think anyone would support a government program that just created some job for someone in some arbitrarily favored industry and said okay we're going to pay this person seven hundred thousand dollars to to do this work that otherwise wouldn't really need to be done and we're going to tax the rest of the country to pay for it um that's kind of a it's kind of a crazy thing when when you start to think about it in those terms um my final question for you is also forward looking what are the what are your biggest concerns and or and also your biggest hopes um for trade policy going forward well um my biggest concern moving forward um sort of this blind allegiance to the idea that parents are good policy, uh, that they create uh, real opportunities for us to charge foreign governments for goods that are made for the United States. Tariffs for taxes, and uh, no one likes to pay more than their fair share of taxes. Uh, what I hope that we can achieve moving forward is a more sensible approach to trade negotiations with other countries and not just the default to slap a tariff on it and all the parts. I could not agree more with that. Mary Jane, thank you so much for joining us. This has been an absolute pleasure and we look forward to seeing what the Beer Institute brings us going forward. Thank you so much. Okay.